further ado, let's let's move on. Uh, Brad, I think you're uh, you're ready to go. Okay, uh, you're up. If you're not speaking, please mute. Does that show up all right? And can you hear me? I see your slide fine, and yes, we can hear you. All right. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, an assembler disassembler for the ESP32 uh, implemented in Forth. Um, the uh, the target system uh, for those that have not followed my work, uh, I've been working on an ES uh, a version of Forth for the ESP32 called ESP32 Forth. Uh, it's a C-based fourth, um, and so uh, sort of peculiar to uh, uh, or peculiar in relation to the history of fourth. Uh, there's there's no assembler at least out of the box. Uh, everything is done in C, uh, and so it, it is a little bit of a lift to add uh, an assembler. Um, the target system uh, uses a CPU called uh, the Tensilica Extensa LX6. Um, this is a uh, um, one of these IP cores that uh, folks will uh, purchase the rights to and then include along with uh, other circuitry uh, on the, the vast uh, spaces that you now have on uh, uh, custom custom chips. Um, it has a lot of options. There's sort of uh, almost like the uh, the old uh, IBM uh, uh, mainframes of old. There are sort of you know, you can add, add in the, the additional uh, optional package for this or that. So if you, you know, want to have uh, uh, windowed registers, you can add that in. If you want to have uh, floating point, you can add that in. If you want to have, uh, uh, you know, various additional uh, uh, divides and so on, you can add that in. And so uh, lots of options that can be toggled on and off, but the ESP32 has a particular uh, uh, collection of those. It's actually um, the same one that was used in the uh, ESP8266, but with a, a, a broader set of choices in terms of uh, the options and an, I believe an additional core and things like that. Uh, there's some very similar successor architecture, uh, LX7, that's used in the ESP32 uh, S2 and 3. Uh, I have not looked into that in, in any depth. Uh, there's an excellent data sheet for it. Um, it is uh, an interesting architecture, but backing up a step, uh, why, why an assembler, uh, especially given that I've got a functional fourth uh, without one? Um, and I got a couple of reasons. One is that uh, I eventually plan to take uh, some machine learning kernels and run them on ESP32 and fourth, and I'm concerned I may need to hand optimize things. Um, and as I've been uh, bringing over more libraries uh, to the ESP32 or experimenting with bringing them in using uh, the, the sort of C bindings and, and C macro tricks that I use, I've found that occasionally uh, there are libraries that assume that you, uh, you are able to do all the things that C can do, and it's a, not all of those have a direct analog uh, in uh, in the sort of layered fourth, so particularly uh, things that involve passing around uh, the addresses of functions, uh, this doesn't always work cleanly. And so uh, I think there there are some libraries where you could import their bindings in a more simple way uh, if if you had the flexibility of, of a small assembly language thunk. Um, and I figured no fourth is complete without one. I think I think this is one of the things that that uh, fourth usually does very well. Um, and and who knows? I if I if I learn enough about the innards of ESP32, uh, maybe I can do away with the C compiler because honestly, the the binaries that we we get for from uh, from it are actually pretty huge. And uh, as we'll see in a sec, there are even some suboptimal uh, things about the code that it produces. Um, why a disassembler? Um, that's a uh, uh, I think one of the, the main things is uh, for me is just to reach out and touch uh, the insides of the machine. But uh, really, you know, what I want to do is understand the code that's generated, uh, see what kinds of register assignments happen, look at the quality of the generated code from C. Um, I kind of can do this. Uh, when, so before I started on ESP32 fourth, I had a, um, a different version that uh, I started to get working on the ESP32 and, and used the IDF tools. 
And uh, one of the uh, advantages of using the, the IDF tools or the, the sort of development kit uh, that uh, is provided by, um, by the, uh, the SP32 folks, um, rather than the, uh, the, the Arduino wrapper, which we use for ESP32 fourth because it uh, is, is more accessible to folks. It's pretty hard to install the, uh, their SDK. And um, that allowed you to, you know, compile a thing and then use objdump and look at the, the generated code. But the Arduino tools kind of hide all of that away. And it's, it's a little harder to get, it, get in at uh, those things. And even if you do that, um, you have to then find your place and, you know, look, look through a bunch of the symbols and uh, it can be pretty hard to find your way. And so to do this directly interactively with fourth is, is fun. Um, and I want to do things like examine the boot code. There's code that uh, runs on the ASP32 that in some cases is uh, baked in. And uh, I want to understand how, how the boot process works and poke around a bit. Um, and, and there's actually some aspects of the ESP32 uh, where it's not documented. They intentionally uh, don't include the in, insides of the, of the Wi-Fi stack and the Bluetooth stack. In some cases, those are proprietary code. And so even in the data sheet, the, sort of the, the various data sheets for the device, they, they tell you, you know, in great detail how they interact with some of the general purpose I.O. on the device. But uh, there's sort of mysterious, weird gaps of like, well, but what if I wanted to talk to the to the Wi-Fi radio or to the Bluetooth uh, radio and so on? And it, it doesn't really tell you uh, how those are hooked in. Um, so all, all reasons to have a disassembler. So the Extensa um, uh, CPU family really um, it has uh, um, two and three byte instructions. Um, it's designed to be relatively space efficient. It's a, a kind of a modern risk architecture, um, sort of le learning from, uh, from past architectures. And is, is actually in many ways a very clean architecture. It's got uh, 16 uh, 32 bit uh, integer registers. But if you, uh, if you use the, um, if you have a version of the chip that has a, uh, the, the windowing option, which uh, was absent on the ESP8266, but is uh, is the option that was selected on the ESP32, then this, uh, these 16 registers are actually just a, a window into a, uh, into a, a set of 64 uh, physical registers. And so as you slide uh, that window back and forth uh, uh, in stack frames, uh, what you can end up doing is, uh, uh, you know, avoiding to, uh, to need to do uh, really anything to update a, uh, uh, the, the stack and, and shuffle things back and forth to memory uh, just by sliding that window. And then when you slide outside of that window, uh, what happens is that it throws a, throws a, a hardware exception and then that uh, lets you have a system handler that uh, can spill out uh, uh, parts of the stack and then you can sort of create a virtual uh, stack that's larger than that. Um, and so that, that could be interesting, especially for a uh, a native fourth bit, as we'll, as we'll see in the, in the current uh, code that's generated uh, that, that isn't used in that way. Um, there's also uh, the floating point option on the device, and, and uh, there's 16 floating point bit registers, uh, floating point registers. I, those do not actually have a window, and I believe you have to sort of manage them independently. Um, so looking at the data sheet here, uh, this, is a, this is a sort of good example of a typical three byte instruction, the add instruction. Um, and so it, it, uh, it has some bits that are, uh, you know, set to indicate uh, the opcode type. And there's kind of a weird, um, because the, it needs to mix uh, three and two byte instructions, typically the, uh, the rightmost uh, bits will indicate sort of the, the, the high level opcode family. And then depending on the instruction, something to the left uh, will disambiguate uh, depending on the sort of subtype. And so, here you you'll have these uh, four bits uh, per uh, per operand, and uh, this this instruction you know loads from uh, a register register S and a register T, adds them and then puts the result in register R. So you know nice nice risky general purpose kind of an operation, um, and uh, weirdly um, there uh, there is a uh, 
a narrow version of this, the two byte instruction. And, and actually you'll notice here that the, this references the code density option. So like virtually everything else on this CPU, uh, everything is, is optional. Um, on the ESP32, they do have the code density option. So they have uh, the, all of the, the two byte instructions. Um, and this uh, packs down uh, the, this, the same ad. In fact, these two, there's almost no reason as far as I can tell that you would want to use this instruction other than trying to meet some alignment uh, goal or something. Um, and I see there's some, some chatter in the chat. So if you have a question, please feel free to chime in and interrupt. I will not be offended if you have a question. Um, another example, uh, this is the, uh, the, the, the uh, logical shift shift left, sort of an inter, integer left shift. Um, and this particular instruction, it, you know, it reads from S and then writes to R and then it shifts it by some amount. Um, the, the page is clipped here, but uh, there's five bits to decide uh, the, the, uh, the amount of the shift. Um, and, and there's actually kind of a weird encoding here where it's um, the, the binary value of those five bits combined uh, subtracted from 32 is the uh, uh, the amount of the shift, and uh, uh, in, I should I, I think I mentioned before this is a 32 bit uh, uh, CPU, and so all of the, the data operations are on 32 bits. Um, here's the uh, the unconditional jump instruction. Uh, it uses a, um, a an 18 bit uh, offset, uh, so it's a relative jump. And uh, it, uh, it gives you full flexibility to, to jump to arbitrary bytes because the, the, uh, the um, instructions can land uh, at arbitrary byte positions because they're, they're variable length. Um, and uh, so um, but let's talk about uh, the call instruction. So the call instruction, there's a couple of different uh, types of them. And this is because uh, there's one way that you might do calling if you were uh, on a, uh, a system without the windowing option in a different way uh, with the calling option. So with, uh, if you don't have the windowing option, uh, you might do a call where you uh, simply call to, to an offset kind of like the jump, um, and then the return address will get stuffed in the A0 register. Um, that's what this, this looks like. Um, and uh, and a key difference between the, the jumps and the calls is that they, uh, the target address has to be 32-bit uh, aligned. And so that uh, allows for uh, uh, things to be uh, multiplied by four and to sort of stretch out the range that you get with this call instruction. Um, there's a version uh, of the, the instruction that supports calling from a register, so out of, out of S. Um, so you can do an indirect call. Um, and the way that, uh, oops, and, and so that's, that's for, for the, uh, the non-windowed case. Now, in the windowed case, um, the way to think of this is that you have your set of uh, registers in the, in the callee, and then um, the, uh, if you do the call, there are, there's a call 4, a call 8, and a call 12 instruction, and these shift the, uh, the window by that, that amount of registers. And so, for example, the call 4, uh, instruction will slide four registers out of the window, uh, preserving them A0, A0 through A3. And then what was in A4 will now be in A0 and, and so on. And then you'll slide into view some, some additional, uh, some additional uh, values. And so this, uh, this means that since, so typically uh, A0 is used uh, as um, uh, to preserve the 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 uh, return address, uh, a one is used uh, by the um, is typically used as a stack pointer for that uh, stack exception handler that I mentioned, uh, spilling things off, and then that leaves you with a call for instruction a two and a three uh, as parameters. So if you have a function with uh, up to two parameters in sort of the C sense, then you can. Uh, you have the option to, 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 to use those and, and you just cleanly do a call and only have to arrange for your, your inputs to be in A2 and A3. Um, and so that's how this instruction is encoded and the others are kind of similar. Um, when you do a call for a window call, they have to uh, land on, on this other instruction called entry. Um, and entry uh, serves, uh, serves the purpose of 
giving the uh, the call of the function the opportunity to uh, reserve some additional uh, storage on the stack. And so you can slide things over uh, and specify um, specify uh, the additional space that you would like to reserve. Um, cool. So, um, so that's the architecture. How to approach an assembler for it? Well, Forth is, is excellent as, as at producing domain-specific languages. Um, and so tip, you know, a typical approach is to say, well, let's pick a syntax that's easy to implement. Um, and uh, for example, Brad Rodriguez has this, this excellent tutorial on uh, sort of in general how one might produce uh, an assembler in Forth. And uh, sort of in summary, right, the typical approach is something like you uh, you know, if for, you might, uh, you know, just um, push the uh, uh, C comma things into the dictionary. So a NOP, you might do something like this. And then if you notice, well, that's a pattern, right? There are a lot of uh, uh, opcodes that maybe don't take a parameter. So maybe you use create does and, and produce a, a word that uh, uh, sort of shortens that and lets you have a, a table of all of those types of words. And uh, similarly, you know, if you've got um, operands, you, you might take them in from the stack and then, uh, uh, you know, compile them in in that same way. And, and those, those could get built uh, similarly into something using create does. And, uh, and then you might have a table of, of general operations. And so this actually allows you to, this kind of a technique allows you to produce an assembler uh, uh, fairly readily and, and, and actually in a fairly compact amount of space. Uh, a call out to Bill Ragsdale 6502 assembler, uh, uh, which uh, I think was in one of the fourth dimensions, and uh, you know he managed to to uh, in in 96 lines and six six screens full uh, to dis describe an entire 6502 assembler. Uh, use a structured flow control, and I mean literally here it is. You know it's it's two screens full of of, of, of material and. Uh, uh, sort of packs that all in, including all the different 6502 addressing modes. And so that's a, a, a very common technique for, for how you might approach an assembler in Forth. Uh, sort of one of these, you know, marvelous things that Forth does well. Um, so what about disassembly? Um, so you can just, uh, you basically can do a disassembler by uh, sort of mimicking what the CPU does, decode the instructions, and then either use a big case statement or a jump table or something to uh, dispatch and, and sort of emit things appropriately and then emit uh, um, the operands and the opcodes. Um, but a thing that, it, that I've been noodling on for a long time is, you know, aren't these two, two kind of the same thing, right? They both list out all of the opcodes. Uh, they both describe the meanings of the operands and the addressing modes. And sort of one is a forward transformation and one is a, is a reverse transformation. And so I, I've been for a long time kind of wondering, could, could we describe both things at once? Could we uh, and, and, and do that in a way that, that maybe is general purpose? Um, and so I got to thinking about, well, what do, you, what, what do we need sort of as the pieces if we wanted to do this? And well, we might need uh, a few kinds of uh, operand bit words to, to describe uh, the, the, the bits, and in fact, it, it, the uh, extensa data sheet kind of is inspirational in this regard. It labels the different bit positions. Well, these are, you know, for R and for S and so on. So you might imagine having some register-like operands and some number-like operands, um, and then you'll still need to handle addressing modes, and you'll need to describe each opcode. So, so then thinking back to this add instruction, what would that look like? Uh, if we sort of try to think of a domain-specific language that cap captures all of what you would need to describe that both for uh, comp for assembly but also for disassembly. And so you might, you know, come up with something like this. Well, you'd list out literally those bit patterns. You know, here's, here's the things that have to be a 1 or a 0 or here are the parts of R and S and T. Um, and, then, and then that's sort of what defines that opcode flowing both directions. Now, um, I, uh, the challenge, of course, if you've got a mixture of words and numbers, although in for fourth is marvelous, you could redefine zero and one, I decided that was a bad idea. And so I, uh, I uh, using L and O, because they look a little bit like a one and a zero. Um, and, and then if you think about sort of the disassembly problem kind of at the same time as the assembly problem, really what you've got is, you know, for a particular instruction, 
you're going to need a bunch of things to, to disassemble it or to assemble it. You're going to, uh, there's some mask that describes the, the set of bits that are, um, you know, what makes that instruction that instruction. Um, and then there's a, and if you were to end that mask with, uh, with the instruction, there are a set of, uh, there's a pattern that you could then uh, compare to, to that instruction. And, uh, and if those, those two are equal, then you'd know you were dealing with that particular kind of instruction. And then similarly, there are uh, separate masks that relate to each of the operands that sort of capture, well, here's where R is, here's where S is, and so on. Um, and so what, what I need is a way to be able to build that up um, from something like what I, what I just showed. And so um, each of these, these letters is sort of doing uh, a particular operation, you know, the, the O is uh, adding in a one in that mask and a zero in the pattern and then adding, you know, zero elsewhere. The L is, you know, adding a one in the pattern and then the R is, is you know, putting a one in the, in the, uh, the mask for R and so on. So um, to, to make it easy, but if you, if you do this, of course, and you're just manipulating state somewhere, then, then you've lost the power of four, fourth stack, right? You're not, uh, you know, how do you pass these around? And so um, what you might want to do is uh, make it possible to pass parameters and, and sort of break them down, down into bits. And a, another kind of interesting observation is that typically you, you, would, you might want to pass in uh, things about the, the bit patterns that make up the opcodes. That would allow you to, uh, to uh, build up uh, sort of compound words in the way that a, a, an assembler is normally done in fourth. But you don't really need that for the, the operands. Typically with operands uh, for a given you know, type of opcode, uh, the, the, the operands are in the same place and you'd be unlikely to want to pass those around as parameters. So I've got this word bits that uh, takes a value off of the stack and then uh, extracts those, that set of bits uh, into the pattern. And so that lets you sort of templatize uh, the structure uh, of each of these words. And then, um, Basically, defining the operands, uh, the operands have sort of uh, three things about them. They're, they describe, they need to describe how to go from a stack value to a bit pattern, and then they need to describe how to go from a, for, dis, for, the, for assembly, and then for disassembly, how to go from a bit pattern uh, out to something that you can print. Uh, and then they also need to capture the mask of the affected bits. Um, and so, uh, what I've landed on, I've got this word names that uh, lets me just define a bunch of register names. And then to, uh, to print a, a, uh, a register out, well, I, I can just take the bit pattern and uh, I'll, I'll print it with, you know, for, for these simple registers on this architecture, I can just print an A in front of them uh, in decimal. And then, um, and then I can have this word register that will leave on the stack uh, two things. It'll def it'll give me uh, the uh, that uh, input conversion uh, operation, and then which in the case of uh, a register could just be a no op, and then in the case of uh, for printing, it, it, it's this register print. And so, if I had the right kind of operand defining word, I could define R and have it uh, indicate that well, R will be a, an operand that involves a register, and same with S and T. And then I can make shortcuts for, for the case where I got four of the four bits of them in a row, um, because that'll be almost always the way that I'll use them. And then that gets me to something like this, right? I can specify the bit patterns that I want. Um, I can specify where the registers are, and then I name the opcode. Um, and then, you know, that, that works for a bunch of different uh, types of, of, of opcodes. I can, I can lay them out in a gigantic table like this, but of course, uh, that will be extremely redundant if I have to, to lay out all of them. And so much like a typical uh, fourth assembler, I will uh, I'll want to break that up into some structure to find some families. And so I can maybe break out the, AL, the you know, there's a class of ALU ops that uh, uh, add is actually a part of. And so I'll, you know, take in, uh, this should really have a stack comment on ALU, but it, uh, you know, takes in the, the uh, um, the value that goes in those four bits, um, and then the others for this particular type of opcode are the same, and then I can lay them out in a table uh, sort of showing the structure of how the, the opcode uh, uh, space is, is broken down as, as you would in a, a typical assembler. Um, 
And then I can do the same thing like with off offsets. This one's a little trickier. So for the jump, uh, there's a calculation relative to uh, the the position of the uh, the word and the uh, uh, there's a sign extension that has to happen here. So when you uh, the jump needs to be uh, sign extended and then needs to be uh, um, shifted by four relative to the address of the opcode, but I can have a definition for uh, what it, what the 18 bits of a uh, of an offset are, and that would let me define uh, a jump uh, in this way. So I would say, well, there's these 18 offset bits, and then this particular bit pattern, um, and and then I can do the same thing for sort of all of the branches. I can put them in a big table and specify. There's a couple of different uh, formats for the uh, the layout of those, uh, and and put them in a in a, a sort of a, a sensible compact table like this. And same story with the uh, the the floating point operations that they they all end in dot s uh, for single precision float on on this architecture and lay them out in a table with the, the same kind of pattern. Um, so so that that's that's actually sort of what I what I've gone and done. Um, now there's one additional wrinkle, and I, I this is borrowing slides from a thing I, I showed to the fourth twenty twenty group, but. Um, the uh, um, one sort of challenge in front of the challenge of an assembler is how to do code words in this the C style uh, uh, this C style fourth, and the challenge is that the C uh, C calling signatures have a stable ABI, but the, there's aside from that, there's no guarantee uh, when you compile C code, it can pick whatever registers it wants. In fact, it can change its mind on every recompile. Um, and the other wrinkle is, so I, I need to use these C calling signatures to produce a, a stable uh, binary interface to call through. And uh, the other issue is that on the ESP32, not all of memory can be used for codes. So you can't just, you know, C comma things into the heap because that's data memory. And so there's a different chunk of memory that I, I allocate uh, space out of and, and uh, reserve for, for code words. Um, and then, uh, so anyways, I, I added code words uh, to the core of it, added a special thunk to get uh, from C with a stable ABI. Um, and oops, this is, it says assembler coming soon because that was what I said at the time. Um, and then it's lazy loaded. So I've got um, a set of uh, code word, you know, code defining words that, that produces this thunk. Um, there's a C here uh, for code, code here. Uh, and then some words to allocate things in that code space. And then the way that the thunks work is that uh, there's a particular C function that takes um, uh, so the stack pointer and then a pointer to the floating point stack pointer. Um, and you'll recall that, um, remember that with those, wi those uh, sliding windows that A2 and A3 were available for parameters. And so this works out nicely on the ESP32 so that you end up being able to use that call for instruction to slide forward. And then um, you can do the same thing on x86 and you'll get particular registers that your piece of assembly code can then uh, know that it needs to use um, uh, when interacting with, with uh, forth. And so you end up knowing how to write the entry point. Um, and this ends up being you know, very easy to, to add into the crazy macro language of ESP32 forth of this <laughs> darling of a bit of garbly goop, but um, but that one opcode gives you that thunk, um, and then uh, this is now without the assembler. You can you can just uh, compile in bytes uh, to to produce a code word, and, and here it is on x86, and here it is on on extensa, and you'll see that there's that entry uh, operation that that we needed for uh, uh, the entry point, and then just just to give an example of how the the this architecture works with the times two. You have to have that entry, leaving uh, a certain amount of stack space available. You uh, do a load from uh, a two is that parameter coming in uh, with the stack pointer. You load you load the value out of the stack. You shift it left by one bit, and then you store it back in to the address at the stack pointer, and then and then return. Um, and you can also dump the bytes, which okay, is not relevant. So, anyways, how to build this up um, very quickly? Um, a key operation, remember, was we had those masks for uh, uh, R and S and T, 
Um, and so you need uh, an opera a set of operations, a pair of them that are kind of inverses of each other. I call them N mask and D mask. And the idea is that uh, you take a, um, uh, a value and then you take a mask and you want to fish out uh, what, bit what bit pattern you would get if you sort of collapsed all of the empty space in the mask. And so with 2, 4, 6, 8, if I have a mask of FO, FO, I want to get out 26. And then you might want to go back the other direction when you're assembling. So you, if you had 12 and then you do F0, F0, you want to stretch that out into 1, 0, 2, 0. Um, so I have not polished these as much as I would like, but, but they are implementable. And this N mask ends up being harder. D mask is a little bit easier. Uh, because you can kind of uh, loop until you're done. I'm not going to dwell on these in the interest of time, but they are uh, doable operations. Um, and then uh, the rest of the implementation is not too bad. So you get uh, uh, you need to keep track of the length of the current uh, opcode that you're on, the pattern that you're on, uh, and the mask. And then uh, I've got this bit operation to sort of uh, shift a uh, shift a single bit into uh, a mask. Um, you do things like uh, needing to skip over um, uh, bit patterns, and then you can define uh, this O and L. Um, and then uh, aligning some details here, which I'll, we can look at later, or you, the code is, is, is up on, on the web and folks can take a look, but you're, you're able to define an operand. And to, to define an operand, you need uh, just that in that input conversion operation that takes it from the stack and uh, con converts it to a, a value that's sort of ready to go into memory, and then a print op value that a print op uh, operation that goes the other direction. And you, I build up a, a linked list of all of the operands. Um, there's that names word that we saw before that's just there for convenience for defining a bunch of registers or, or, or enumerated values. And then to define an opcode, you uh, you just need uh, you need it to uh, go through, and this actually really is the assembler. So you uh, you remember the uh, the bit pattern and the mask. Uh, you snapshot the operands, um, and then when it comes time to apply that word, you uh, you pull out the pattern. You pull out. You go through each operand, and uh, one by one. Uh, there's a little bit of this is a little hard to read because it uh, finds the end of the, the list of operands and then goes backwards through them uh, because you want to do them in reverse order for the assembly. And so you one by one pull them off the stack and uh, and mask them and then or that into the uh, instruction pattern. And then at the end of this, you, you know the length and you can uh, compile that into the dictionary. And uh, this this is the whole disassembler. You, it's, it's sort of the same thing the other direction. So you loop through all of the opcodes that you know about, and you uh, end them with the mask, uh, and then uh, check to see if that matches your pattern. And if it matches, uh, then you can demask each of the operands and uh, uh, print them one by one. And then you can just print the name of uh, of the uh, uh, the operation the opcode that matched. Um, and then the disassembly uh, loop is just going through and trying that until you find a match uh, and then printing the, the addresses and so on around it. Um, and so you can now use this assembler to code a word uh, like my two star here and use a syntax very similar to, to the assembler, but in a kind of a fourthy uh, RPN style. Um, and then uh, when you go, you can go and disassemble that word. And uh, here I'm looking at the cell after the uh, um, the, ex uh, the execution token because that's the one that contains the address of the the the, uh, the code. Uh, and then I'm disassembling five instructions, and out comes uh, roughly what you put in. Um, and here it is in hex. Um, um, so uh, we'll take a little tour of it in a moment, but it's the generic assembler disassembler is, is 113 lines, uh, not too bad. And uh, it is not quite complete, uh, and there are some caveats to it, but it has uh, encodings for all but uh, maybe like 5% of the, the extends instructions in about 286 lines. Um, and uh, it's 
I've done it in a way that it's lazy loaded on first run because a constant struggle on the ESP32 uh, with the ESP32 fork is that anything that I put in the dictionary uh, ends up taking a certain amount of heap space and, and data spaces at a premium, whereas flash space is uh, relatively more free on the device. Um, and uh, one sort of unfortunate wrinkle is that it currently mixes in uh, on the ESP32. It's uh, you're not allowed to just read arbitrary bytes safely, and so uh, there's some code that's there to make it safe to read an unaligned uh, an unaligned uh, word, uh, which probably should be factored out into a different place. Um, so uh, there's a good bit to do. There's a few missing opcodes. Uh, there's some places where I haven't done the right numerical decoding of some of the operands. Um, I don't have any uh, any structured uh, flow control for for the assembler as yet because it, it's just sort of ha getting the basics. It needs better tests. It's not uh, it's not really tested at all at this point. Um, and there's a there's some cleanup that could happen on what's there. I think it it, it uh, suffered from my um, kind of in the in the source file for the assembler. Um, trying to find uh, natural bit patterns by sort of first laying everything out uh, directly and then looking for which things matched with other things. Um, there is actually in the data sheet a fairly good uh, logical description of, of kind of the operand or opcode families, and I, I probably could have hewed closer to the operand uh, or opcode families in the, the data sheet. Um, and then maybe maybe I go and try it uh, for RISC-V5 because there's actually an ESP32C3 that uses RISC-V5 or uh, try it for X64. That could be a bit of a challenge because uh, X64 has large enough opcodes that they don't fit into a machine word. And so I would probably need to, to play some games to, to make this approach generalized to that. Um, and, and then before I go demo a thing, I'll, I'll leave you with an interesting thought. The same sort of thought process has got me wondering, well, well, what about emulation? What if I wanted to write a, an M, you know, I'm, I'm oftentimes testing things on my, X, you know, X64 desktop, uh, and it's a, it's a pain to flash something each time onto the chip. Uh, when I make changes, wouldn't it be nice if I could do emulation? Well, maybe emulation isn't that hard either. If I've got the bit patterns to, to decode for assembly and dis, disassemble, um, if I also add a little snippet of executable code, maybe I could uh, tack on uh, in a fairly dense uh, notation uh, the meaning of the opcode as well. Uh, and uh, maybe maybe it would you know would maybe double the double or triple the size of the uh, the, the content. So with that, I'm gonna pop out of here and I'm going to actually let me let me start with a I'll take a quick quick look at the um, so the um, the assembler, just to give you a sense, um, uh, this is really it, and it's you know it's got that N mask and D mask. It, um, there's a little bit that I elided, but uh, that that is it. That's the that's the generic the generic core of the thing, and then the extends a specific pieces of the assembler, uh, you know, define the registers. Define uh, this numeric type for the the operands. Defines a bunch of operand shortcuts. Some different decodings for the calls and jumps and entries and so on. Oops. Um, defines the register operands that we saw before, and then it's it's just a big table of opcodes. And so some of the opcodes are you know this is actually all of the uh, the two byte opcodes. They all end in dot n for narrow. Uh, and they sort of fit into a nice little table, and so I haven't done anything to compact them particularly. Um, and then there are a bunch of uh, sort of uh, no parameter opcodes that that have a bit pattern. I probably could collapse that into something, um, but I, I, I was you know sort of looking for patterns in the bit codes, uh, bit patterns, and so I haven't haven't collapsed these. Um, the ALU ops, I've you know kind of collapsed those, and there's a couple of different families of them. There's some branches, some calls. There's a lot of opera. Uh, actually, some of these are optional. Uh, and uh, for the, the CPU, there's an optional set of caching opcodes that let you uh, indicate uh, which things to prefetch into the uh, into the into the CPU's ca uh, data cache. Uh, there's the load store operations. 
Um, uh, there's some, actually some, uns, uh, literally an unsorted pile of ones that I haven't figured out where they belong, but including things like this uh, uh, relative, or, or sorry, uh, indirect, uh, indirect jump. Um, there's some conditional opcodes and the ALU uh, opcodes for this, the, the single precision floats. There's some com more comparison opcodes. There's a bunch of these uh, variations on uh, some, the mul multiply. There's a bunch of different ways uh, that the multiply works. And these, I don't actually feel like I need to go looking. Uh, uh, here I'm mimicking uh, the na they have these terrible names where it's sort of a multiply uh, and involves like a, an auto decrement. And these are, these are designed for doing these very tight filter kernels that I, I think are you know, intended to be sort of super efficient. Um, but they, they're really kind of ugly opcodes that are hard to understand. And so this might be a case where rather than just mimic the exact opcode from the, the data sheet, it might make sense to you know, come up with something that's a little easier to understand or decomposes the parts into uh, some structure. Um, a bunch of um, uh, system privileged ones I haven't sorted yet, um, and then a few, a few for uh, synchronization because it is a multi-core CPU, and, and, and that, that's really it. Let me go and switch over. I'm going to fire up a... Uh, so I'm connected to this, this uh, ESP32 uh, board, and I'm going to open up a just the serial terminal and let me, let me connect to that. Um, if I can find, there we go. And uh, so I'm gonna do, I'm gonna reboot the thing with, with by and you'll see this is really an ESP32. <laughs> um, and uh, um, so by default, the assembler is not there, but if you do extends assembler, that will sort of force load it and it takes a minute to compile, which is, uh, says, says, says something. Um, and uh, let's uh, let's see here. I'm going to go and, and this is where you pull out the pre-baked uh, sample. But I'll I'll, um, I'll paste in. Uh, oops, I will I will paste in uh, a uh, some code. And this is that my two star. And you know, just to prove that it works, we can run it. And then we've got a you know uh, we've got an, another implementation of of a multiply. You can disassemble it by. Uh, I need to make this more convenient, but you can. What you do is you uh, you get the uh, the address of it, and you have to get the cell afterwards, and then do disassem, and then whoa! I forgot a parameter. This is what happens when you the joys of of real hardware and and no memory protection. Actually, there is a there is some capability in the ESP32 for memory protection. Uh, and one of the other reasons I want to get good at uh, poking around on uh, on the device is that uh, I, I still hold out hope that kind of like uh, GeForce, I might be able to uh, I might be able to uh, create kind of a, um, uh, a fault handler so that uh, if you access the bad piece of memory, uh, bad things wouldn't happen. So uh, let's try that again. Uh, my two star cell plus at, and the thing that I forgot was I needed to say how many instructions I want to disassemble. Um, and so you'll see there's junk down here at the bottom. And then um, I, and I really shouldn't be getting these unknown instructions. There's a very small percentage of instructions that I've, I've left out. Uh, and it looks like now maybe that I've also left out sort of the, the space marked as reserved. So that's the other other possibility of why there's these unknown ones in here. But anyways, you see, you see, I get back my uh, my input. Um, the other fascinating thing you can do with a disassembler is uh, you can disassemble the code that comes out of uh, the the uh, the C compiler. And so taking a look at like the the word plus, uh, I can disassemble that. And actually, yeah, yeah, I'll do twenty, and then. Uh, so th this this gives a sort of an interesting insight into the code that's produced uh, by the C compiler. So um, to to make some sense of this, so this is the extent of the the plus word, and um, the so this is not a stable thing, and so it won't be true probably the next time the thing compiles. But I pre pre went through and figured out what the register mapping is here, and so uh, in this particular compilation of the code, A four is the top of stack. Um, 
and then um, the uh, what is it? Uh, or sorry, a seven is top of stack. A four is the stack pointer, um, and then uh, uh, it doesn't matter here, but a eight is the return pointer, uh, although it's not used in the way a conventional return pointer is used. And then the instruction pointer is in a three, um, and then. A12 is, is what uh, Brad Rodriguez calls the W register, uh, sort of in the, in the abstract worth, uh, uh, in, in an indirect threaded fork, it's the uh, sort of you load the, you load the, uh, the uh, opcode, or sorry, you load the, uh, the address at the uh, instruction pointer into the W, and then you, the indirection is you then load the address at W into, into the X register, which is, is a, in this case, is A14. Now, uh, even if you don't follow any of that, like the thing here is notice this is, this is the add. And, and so here's the actual add operation that, that uh, embedded in, in all of that. And then um, the, um, uh, the other, but the most interesting thing about this code is notice this jump uh, to a particular address. And this is an example of, of a case where the C compiler um, uh, is, is producing su basically suboptimal code. And the, this is a, a, an instance of a, a problem that uh, the GeForce folks have regularly flagged to GCC and LLVM and those folks, which is that um, C compilers don't tend to like to produce, uh, when, you, when you have code that involves things like in, uh, computed go-tos, uh, they really, really don't like uh, sort of interleaving uh, the uh, code code that will uh, branch somewhere unpredictable uh, at the end of a basic block. And so what, if we disassemble uh, this, uh, this place that it's jumping to, you'll see that what's happening here is that it's gone to the trouble of putting a, a JX is a, uh, a jump through a register. And so it's jumping through A14 um, and every opcode uh, implementation of the core opcodes uh, is at the end jumping to that same address just to then call an indirect jump. And uh, the, uh, the G4 folks are constantly bugging the GC folks, GCC folks because they, they regularly have regressions where this optimization, this should really get optimized to have that, uh, that indirect jump uh, be here, but it's very antithetical to the uh, to the sort of uh, flow control and, and, and uh, code analysis that happens in a, in a C optimizer. And so this is a, a sort of an ongoing problem with threaded interpreters. And the same thing happens for other, other threaded, it's not just sort of, you know, it, it, Python inter interpreters and things like this suffer from the same, same issue, but it's, you know, for fourth, it's particularly uh, frustrating because uh, fourth tends to have these very small opcodes. And so it's very, uh, inefficient, but let's let's take a look at maybe a few more if we we can see. Um, so let's let's pick that, let's pick the min the min operations. The min operation um, there's an opcode for min, and so you'll see that in, here's here's the opcode, and uh, it, it actually ends up producing a min uh, instruction uh, because I because I actually hand coded the, the min. And um, let's see, we could take a look at, at XOR for example, and uh, and uh, here you'll get out. Here's here's what it uh, what the C compiler emitted for for XOR. And so uh, so in one sense, all of the opcodes uh, in the core of the, the system um, are not so different from what you might produce by hand. They're just sort of laid out one by one. And um, I won't belabor it, but this is this is all just sort of in, in a weird interleave order, doing the um, doing the, the the indirect threading, and you you do uh, sort of a load from the instruction pointer, a load. Uh, a load from that, uh, and then this jump jumps to a, an indirect call through A14. So, um, with that, are there are there any questions? Stunned silence. Uh, I see some questions in the in the chat. Let me quickly. Uh, what board is it running on? It is running on the ESP32. Uh, so this is uh, you can you can learn more about the project at, at uh, e4th.appspot.com. Uh, this is the ESP32 fourth, 
And uh, let's see, um, someone asked, uh, can you do inline assembly in the Arduino IDE? Uh, that is a good question. I, so in general, uh, GCC historically has allowed inline assembly and, uh, and so uh, usually you can. Um, for the, the um, however, I, I don't know off the top of my head whether it's actually, let's see. I don't know off the top of my head whether, what, so there's a couple of architectures where they've kind of um, varied a little in terms of uh, the, the level of support. So I don't know with 100% confidence if you can do inline assembly uh, for, for uh, Extensa. I would be, uh, I, I think it's high likely, likelihood that you could. And that would be another option if you were building your own, uh, if you're taking the, the ESP32 code and wanted to just incorporate a single uh, hand optimized routine, you could no doubt do that with uh, the inline assembler. One, one challenge, depending on what you were building, uh, that you would have at that level is that you, uh, you might not, uh, you, you would you, typically when you do inline assembly with the, with the, the C syntax that GCC supports, um, you, uh, you sort of need to use it um, in a context where you, uh, you kind of have access to all the inputs and outputs. And so one of the wrinkles is that the, um, uh, some of the registers, or sorry, some of the, well, the virtual registers uh, might be hard to get to. So it could be done, but, uh, but would, would be challenging. Um, no, this fourth is, is actually indirect threaded. Um, and so uh, it, that's, that's partially just a concession to, uh, it, is, it is actually not even, uh, even indirect threading is, is non-trivial to do in C, uh, and vanilla C can't do it directly, but GCC and, and uh, Clang both support uh, a, uh, a sort of a, a non-standard extension called a computed go-to, uh, where you, if you have the address of a label, you can, uh, you can jump to it. And so I use, uh, I use computed go-tos uh, to, uh, to, to do uh, what amounts to indirect threading and it emits the code like you saw. However, it has the problem that if the optimizer fails to recognize it, it may add an extra jump between the indirect uh, uh, the indirect jump and the and the the individual opcode and there's a slight caveat in that there is a Windows version of uh, of ESP32 or it's micro E4. Uh, it it unfortunately through macro magic ends up using a switch statement and it does not actually end up getting uh, getting that indirect. Uh, it ends up having some extra indirection through a uh, sort of an opcode number and that's because unfortunately the Microsoft uh, uh, compilers that I use don't end up uh, having support for um, uh, the computed go-to. Um, I don't know if that answers. So yes, you could do inline assembly that way. The, 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 and if your only goal was to compile sort of an optimized routine, that might even be the expedient way to do it. In fact, actually, I should say for the, the version of ESP32 fourth for uh, x64, um, when I went to go implement uh, star slash mod, I actually ended up doing that as an assembly li language routine uh, because that is a that is a it, it was it was galling to uh, do the sort of the bit shifts that you would have to do uh, to implement that when there's perfectly good instructions on the CPU that are capable of doing a star slash mod. Um, and so I, I, I caved and did, did a little bit of inline assembly for that one piece on, uh, on that particular architecture. For ESP32, I, I don't have any inline assembly. Brad, can you hear me? Yes. You mentioned Brad Rodriguez, uh, and unfortunately I was a little distracted at the time. Uh, how would I find that Brad Rodriguez stuff? I, I have a link in my slides, uh, and I can, okay, good, I can good, 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 good. Stephen A says, "Have you thought of making an optimizer?" Um, I, I yes. have. Yes, I have. It's called. Well, never mind. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, in the interest of time. Um, yeah, yes, I have. Um, one of the things, actually, the other reasons I've, I've pondered doing. Um, doing this this assembler is that 
Um, because this is a kind of a risk style architecture, it's actually pretty easy to generate to choose what instructions you want to generate. And so I I have this other idea that sort of has this as a pre this assembler as a prerequisite, uh, which is that I I could imagine a mode of operation where I walk through the indirect threaded code and then sort of transform it into uh, code that I could could do an optimization pass on. So I, that's a thing I have thought about what it would look like, how hard it would be. It, it certainly would would be easier on a machine where you have enough registers to uh, to sort of be your whole stack. Um, so it would probably be if I if I were to do it, it would probably be. Uh, Sort of only optimize an individual word, and only with the constraint that it, you know, has maybe no loops in it, and no, uh, and, and uses uh, uh, uses a, a finite number of uh, stack slots. So, is that what uh, Fourth Incorporated's Fourths do? They look at code and sort I, of. I I actually don't I actually don't know it, how decide whether. I, I, I know that they actually produce pretty nice code from the, the output that I've looked at their disassembly. I don't, I believe it's their secret sauce, so I don't know the exact approach that they use, but they seem to be, uh, I mean, they're, and, and they're, I believe, subroutine threaded, and so they, they sort of layer on top of that. Um, uh, so I, I, yeah, I, I don't know the approach they're using, but it, it seems decent in terms of the, the, X, the x86 code it generates, at least from what I've, little I've poked at it. All right, so this was the trial of uh, the uh, hotspot version of uh, Zooming. I used the uh, browser version and it runs really slowly. So anyone that has uh, comments, uh, get back to me on it offline. So uh, Brad, were you... Uh, were you done at this time? I, I am done. All right. Thank you so much. It, it's uh, amazing how you can do all of this stuff and, and keep up with your day job and your family and your kids. And when is your head going to explode? Any second now, I gather. All right. <laughs>